You want a war? You're gonna get one. Now get the guns, the drugs, from my generation, I'll take the fall. Welcome back to Reliving the War and welcome to the 11th of May 1998. Tonight Raw comes from Baltimore, Maryland while Nitro's live from Kansas City, Missouri. This week Nitro airs at its usual time and the show's also back to 3 hours so it's going to be interesting to see if they immediately bounce back in the weekly television ratings. That also means that this week we're going back to checking out Nitro's unopposed R before looking at the head to heads. Before doing that though, just to be transparent with you guys, YouTube's been hitting the channel recently and that means I'm going to have to pull some videos and re-upload them. The two recent pay-per-view videos, Unforgiven and Spring Stampede, were restricted by YouTube and if you want to learn about that, have a look on my Twitter page. You might get a good laugh out of their responses or lack thereof. So I just want to let you guys know right now that you will see re-uploads on the channel and I do apologise for that. I know it can be annoying seeing the same videos on your feed and I really don't like putting re-uploads on the channel but the whole purpose of reliving the war is to have the entire Monday Night War from start to end available to anyone who wants to check it out and if videos get restricted for reasons they could get the whole channel flag then I have no choice but to re-upload. So for the sake of reliving the war, the prosperity of the series and I won't lie my own livelihood, you'll see Unforgiven and Spring Stampede on the channel again very soon. Again have a look on Twitter if you want to see what YouTube thought I said in those videos and you'll understand why it's both upsetting and extremely annoying at the same time and also have a look at the replies and you'll see they had absolutely no interest in fixing their own mistake. Alright, let's have some fun. Mean Gene Okerlund welcomes Bret Hart to the ring to kick off Monday Nitro and all Bret's gonna do here is promote his upcoming match with Randy Savage this week at Slamboree. The commentators are still unsure if Bret's joined the NWO, he isn't wearing the black and white, he isn't coming out to NWO music and because Bret didn't get a chance to really explain why he helped Hollywood Hogan a few weeks back, there's still some doubt in regards to his true motivations. Even that stuff with Brian Adams last week isn't enough to convince the commentators that Bret's part of the New World Order. Brett says Randy Savage always wanted to be the best there is, the best there was and the best there ever will be but Randy would hide away from Brett because he was afraid of Brett. Savage has crawled from under his rock to face the hitman at Slamboree. Brett's gonna prove he's better than Savage and he's gonna prove to the fans that he's as good as he says he is. It's not easy being a hero and because it's a thankless job in WCW Brett says there's no point in trying to be a hero. So Brett's just gonna continue being the excellent of execution and Randy Savage is next on Brett's hit list. The Macho Man's going to answer Brett in a moment, but first. Disco Inferno took on Barry Horowitz next on Nitro. This is Barry's Nitro debut though he's been in WCW since October 1997 and Barry of course is the kind of guy who Disco can get a win over. Horowitz stayed in WCW until early 2000 and during this whole time while employed by WCW he only won two matches. This isn't one of those matches. Disco got the win with a swinging neckbreaker, he has to wait for Ed Leslie to go away before he can use the chartbuster again. The Wolfpack's Randy Savage comes to the ring and he says if it wasn't for Bret Hart Hulk Hogan wouldn't have the NWO Wolfpack title around his waist. Bret won't be applying the sharpshooter on Randy at Slamboree but Bret can certainly die while trying. Tonight though Randy doesn't want to face Brett, he wants a fight with Hollywood Hogan. Please god not again. Randy says the mega parts have to do it one more time here on Nitro so he makes it official, he wants a title shot. He calls Hollywood Hogan a bald headed reject from the glue factory and I don't know why but that made me laugh for a solid 5 minutes. And Randy says Hogan has his title and the macho man wants it back. Juventud Guerrera and Smackhead Kidman had another match, Guerrera landed a Hoovy driver before Big Reese's Christmas advent calendar got in the ring and Hoovy got slammed to the mat once again. 
Kidman then performed the seven year itch but keep an eye on this Kidman fan right here. His sign says Kidman I want your itch which is I don't know it's a little forward and he goes absolutely insane when Kidman hits the move it's like he's having an out of body experience. Big Reese carries Hoovy back up the ramp after the match, the flock are gonna eat good tonight. Eric Bischoff then overcompensates by riding his motorbike to the ring, he's here all alone and well this is quite the promo right here. Bischoff says that Vince McMahon has been sending his little wannabes around and these wannabes want to talk to Easy e he's talking about DX right here. Eric says DX only show up where Vince McMahon knows Eric won't be but Eric has a solution for that. Bischoff then says Sean Waltman knew Eric wouldn't be in the CNN offices when DX showed up, we'll show footage of that a little later on Rob by the way, and Bischoff says bite me in regards to X-Pac wanting an apology. Slambery is coming up and Eric has a great idea, WCW's in WWF's backyard for the pay per view, so maybe Vince McMahon should attend the show and step into the ring with Bischoff. That's right, Eric has challenged Vince to a fight. Bischoff does a wonderful job at reverse promotion next when he tells fans not to buy the pay per view if they think Vince is gonna show up. He says McMahon isn't man enough to step inside the ropes with Bischoff, that Eric will be there and if Vince shows up Eric's gonna knock him out. It's a very cool Monday Night War story and it's quite a ballsy move from Bischoff but it also reeks of desperation too. Eric said that at the time he felt he had to come up with an answer for Operation DX and this was what he came up with, legitimately challenging Vince McMahon to a fight. We'll see if Vinnie Mac shows up later in the week during the Slambery review. After this the Nitro Guards come out to entertain the fans in attendance but the real entertainment begins when a hero steps out into the arena. I hope YouTube doesn't demonetize big bratwursts, I need Alex's giant sausage. Oh, big bratwurst. That no good, dirty, rotten, stinking, glue factory working hyena Doug Dillinger once again disrupts Alex Wright and I think we need to get together and start an online petition. We need to get Doug removed from WCW, this is nothing but abuse of power. Scott Norton dominated Yuji Nagata next, the commentators used this match to talk about the split in the new world order and after the match Tony Schiavone flat out says that NWO Wolfpack looks like a much stronger faction in comparison to the black and white NWO. Hugh Morris then defeated Jim Powers in 30 seconds, not even kidding. I'm not surprised that Jim took a quick loss, I'm more surprised that they gave Morris such a quick victory, nobody in the audience cared by the way. Our number one ends with Kevin Nash and Conan coming to the ring and Nash says it was he and Scott Hall who formed the NWO back in 1996. Hogan saw that money train leaving so he decided to jump on board. The NWO has had good times and bad times but there's only one NWO and it's the boys who wear the red and black. The Wolfpack know that Hogan's flying into Kansas City tonight so Nash wants Hogan to come to the ring, tell Nash that Big Kev's bigger, stronger, younger and sexier than Hollywood. Hogan then has to remove his black and white NWO colours and say to Kevin that it's Nash's world order. The NWO music then plays in the arena a little early, Nash wasn't finished saying what he had to say. I guess that's a wrap, they cut us off. We have an announcement from Vince McMahon on Raw while on Nitro Ultimo Dragon takes on Johnny Swinger. After announcing that Stone Cold Steve Austin's gonna compete in a tag team match tonight, McMahon introduces the number one contender for the WWF Championship and it's Dude Love. Dude Love has had a shave, he's got his teeth in and he's looking pretty corporate. He gets in the ring, he puts on his glasses and while speaking in a very professional manner, Mick says he was confused about who he was last week but this week he knows the answer to that question. Mick's a well educated man, a speaker of four different languages, he reads Greek tragedy and he's a student of American history, a lover of women, a leader of men and a surprisingly good dancer for someone his size. Stone Cold's fixing to find out that Dude Love's the toughest SO be in the WWF and he's also going to be the next WWF champion. Dude Love then says he almost lost his smile but with the support of Vince McMahon he's once again found his smile and it feels good. Dude then gives Vince a big old hug and Vince says he has a surprise for Mick. Vince introduces the guest timekeeper for the Dude Love vs Steve Austin match at WWF Over the Edge, the esteemed Gerald Briscoe. 
The match also needs a special guest ring announcer, it's Hall of Famer and Vince McMahon stooge Pat Patterson. Mr McMahon says there's also going to be a special referee in this match and after hyping up a man who stands tall above everyone else and a man with an awe inspiring physical presence, a man who will set new officiating standards in WWF, McMahon welcomes this mystery referee to walk down to the ring. But no one shows up. After trying to announce this guy again, McMahon decides to walk to the back and find out where he is. Foley, Patterson and Briscoe stand in the ring for a moment waiting for the referee to get revealed and then Patterson grabs a microphone. He says the referee is the best there is, the best there was and the best there ever will be. The commentators are shocked for a moment but Bret Hart can't be in two places at the same time. Out walks Vince McMahon wearing a referee shirt that complements his 24 inch pythons, so clearly Steve Austin has his hands full on May 31st. We then cut over to footage recorded earlier in the day, apparently DX are in Atlanta and they are going to visit WCW's corporate offices, this is what Bischoff talked about earlier. The security guard will not let DX in the building even though they are being polite to the guy, I think their choice of clothing and the fact that Bruce Pritchard's pointing a camera in the security guys face didn't help matters though. Billy Gunn says the cops were called so DX move on to their next target and we'll come back to this soon. Over on Monday Nitro, Ultimo Dragon began having a few issues when going up against Johnny Swinger, I know, surprising, so Chavo Guerrero came down to cheer on his new favourite wrestler. Dragon was then able to get Swinger up for the Dragon Stanner and I've no idea what went wrong here, Ultimo Dragon just kind of falls doesn't he? Still Dragon wins, Eddie runs down to slap Chavo around a little, but this time Chavo shoves Eddie to the canvas and the crowd absolutely loved it. Eddie then gave Chavo a free shot but Chavo wouldn't take it, Ultimo Dragon however was happy to jump in and apply his dragon sleeper. Chavo tries to break it up, Eddie still is his uncle after all and when Dragon lets go Eddie launches an attack. Again Chavo tries to stop these two from fighting and Eddie's none too pleased with both his nephew and Ultimo Dragon. The fans loudly chant Eddie sucks as he walks back up the ramp. Over on Raw, Kevin Kelly's standing outside waiting for Stone Cold. Double K thinks Austin's here right now for an interview but no, it's Al Snow. The last time we saw this guy he was Leaf Cassidy and it looks like a little time in ECW has made him, well, it's made him lose his mind I guess. Al's got some tickets to the show and he blames his mannequin head, named Head, for giving him wrong directions to the arena. Al says he has some good tickets and he asks Kevin where he needs to go and he continues to talk to Head after getting directions. Up next, Vader takes on Barry Windham on Raw, on Nitro we've got a Dusty Rhodes promo and Goldberg vs Len Denton. So Vader's back in the ring tonight and it started off as expected with Vader getting rough right at the opening bell. This sunset flip botch happens though where Vader falls on top of Barry and you can see Vader giving Barry a few moments to make sure he's okay. Barry shows he's all good with a hard lariat. Jim Ross announces a Vader vs Kane match for Over the Edge where the loser will have to unmask. Yeah, fans might actually get to see what's under Vader's mask, how exciting. The Midnight Express double team Vader on the outside and back in the ring Barry goes for that sunset flip again as a UFC advert gets shown on the screen. Vader jumps on Barry's chest but this time it was a bit more controlled, thankfully. Vader hits a splash, he then goes up for a Vader bomb and that's all she wrote, Vader wins on Raw's war. The Midnights then try to attack the big man and they both get annihilated, so Vader just took out an entire faction all on his own. Over on TNT, Dusty Rhodes says Kevin Nash is going to be in Hollywood Hogan's face before the night ends. He says Hollywood Hogan and Eric Bischoff are sitting at the table the American Dream set for them years ago and these two are not doing right by the NWO because they fired six and they publicly berated Scott Hall. Dusty and Scott go back a long way and right now Scott Hall is fixing a personal problem, something that Dusty and Eric Bischoff know all about. But Scott will be at Slamboree and he will compete in the ring. Dusty then completely messes up when he says Macho Man Randy Savage needs to stop bitching. <laughs> Clearly Dusty forgot which side of the NWO he was on for a moment but he quickly goes back to talking about Scott Hall when he realises he screwed up. He promises again that Scott will be at Slamboree and Nash is going to see Hollywood Hogan later on Nitro. He walks away and the crowd are left confused, when he made that Randy Savage comment the crowd booed loudly. Goldberg then came out to annihilate Len Denton. Len Denton was once TL Hopper's tag team partner when they were the Dirty White Boys and those who were in the mid south and world class would remember him as the grappler. Goldberg's like yeah grapple this, spear, jackhammer, one, two, three. 
We have a bit of catching up to do on the streak. The commentators say this is 83-0. So, on the 28th of April, Goldberg beat Scott Norton at a house show. He then defeated Saturn on the 6th of May at another house show. On the 9th of May, Goldberg defeated Van Hammer on WCW Saturday Night, a tape show of course. So, on the same night, he was able to wrestle Saturn again live at a house show and he was able to win. Saturn once again fell to Goldberg the very next night at a live event. So, this victory over Denton on Nitro made means that Goldberg is actually 78-0. Hawk vs Skull on Raw, Saturn vs Jerry Lynn with an F on Nitro. So Hawk vs Skull, there are no winners with this one are there? The dreaded DOA vs LOD rivalry is upon us, Animal and 8ball fight for a bit before getting out of the ring, and Hawk takes the early lead with a jumping shoulder tackle, a body slam and a fist drop. Hawk misses a diving clothesline, he ends up on the outside where Animal has to save him from 8ball but Skull takes the lead when the match resumes. Hawk gets a boot up when Skull tries an aerial attack. Hawk then tries a corner shoulder tackle but as always he hits the ring post before falling out of the ring. The DOA again perform the old switcheroo and 8ball ends up winning the match with the worst small package in the history of pro wrestling. If two guys who call themselves Skull and 8ball can beat you then it's time to consider a career change. During this match, Jim Ross announced a DX vs Nation of Domination match at Over the Edge. And speaking of DX, we see footage of Hunter's squad visiting the CNN Center. The faction didn't get a tremendous amount of footage here because, as explained by X-Pac, they were told they couldn't film because the CNN Center was not public property. The only notable thing here is Billy Gunn trying to get a meeting with Ted Turner. He tells security that the group are good friends with Teddy Boy and Ted would send them up right away if he knew DX had arrived. After this, we get another Edge vignette. He is the truth that you deceive. deceive. The lie that you believe. You believe. He is the God to which you pray. The devil he must repay. He is the bullet and the gun. Pain from which you run. He is the silencing machine. On Monday Nitro, JJ Dillon comes to the ring followed by Raven, and it turns out that Raven has put in a grievance against WCW. Dillon explains that this all stems from that guy who keeps attacking flock members after matches, the guy who was selling delicious cold beverages last week. So Raven spoke to his lawyer and WCW now have an unsafe working environment lawsuit on their hands. Thanks Raven. Dylan says he doesn't like Raven but Raven has a point. He and the flock have been getting attacked by some random guy in the audience, so to rectify this, Raven's gonna have his very own rad squad who are gonna provide him with additional security. The boys walk down to the ring, the flock follow, and Raven announces a Bari deathmatch. It's an enclosed steel cage encounter where the loser won't be able to answer a 10 count. Should be a good one. Raven then brings up the issues between Saturn and Hammer, and seeing as Saturn got beat last week, Saturn must leave the faction. Raven tells Saturn to come down to the ring. Kidman takes the mic and he says Saturn may have lost but Hammer's the biggest loser of them all. And the big man then gets attacked by the flock. Saturn hits the death volley driver and Raven says Saturn's his enforcer and Saturn stays beside him at all times. Quote the Raven nevermore. So yeah, I think Van Hammer's out of the flock. Last week was pointless. Jerry Flynn then jumps in the ring to fight Saturn. It was supposed to be Hammer vs Flynn but who cares. The match ends in no time at all after Saturn hits another Death Valley driver. So quite a lot was covered here during this part of Nitro. Raven has a new security team, he's facing DDP again on pay per view, Van Hammer's out of the flock and Saturn finally got his hair cut. Bradshaw's trying to learn Takamichi Noku how to drive. Taka pays up, he has some issues putting the car into drive, and when the two get back from their lesson, they get attacked by Club Kamikaze. The little dude in the suit is shown without his mask, and he says, This is Kayentai. So it appears the faction have had a name change. We have got mid card madness next on both shows Double J vs. Farouk on Raw, Fit Finley vs. Robbie Rage on Nitro. Double J not only has to deal with Farouk tonight, he also has to deal with this big move fucking problem right here. 
Michael Cohn says this is gonna throw Jared off his game, but it's gonna do way more than that, Michael. Blackman found out that Double J tried to form a tag team with the giant robot monster, so it's payback time. After an inverted atomic drop and a clothesline from Farouk, Double J finds himself on the outside, and this is Blackman's chance for revenge. Sweet T Lee tries to stop the inevitable, but he gets chased away before Steve O turns around and he lands a devastating, chest crushing Mavuga kick. If you listen close, you can hear Double J's heart give out upon impact. Back in the ring, Farouk goes to end it with a dominator, but the nation run down and the match gets thrown out. Farouk's old faction launches an attack, so Steve Blackman jumps in like the absolute superhero he is. Unfortunately though, Jared attacks Steve-O with his own nunchucks, and it's a brutal beatdown here on Raw's War. Double J doesn't understand how powerful those enchanted nunchucks truly are, but Steve knows all too well how much damage they can cause. Double J gets out of the ring, shocked by the unlimited power of Steve Blackman's nunchucks, and it's at this very moment where Double J realized he just signed his own death warrant. On Nitro, Fit Finley defends his TV title against Robbie Rage. I like high voltage, but how Robbie became number one contender, I have no idea. So you've got a brawler against the powerhouse in this one, and it could have been a decent match if it all played out. Robbie Rage got in a clothesline, this slam right here, while Finley was holding onto the ropes. He also performed a power slam before landing a vaulting splash, but he couldn't keep Finley's shoulders to the mat. Kenny Chaos was just about to interfere before Booker T ran down to stop him, and this leads to Chris Benoit following Booker T and a fight breaking out between the two rivals. JJ Dillon comes down and he cancels Booker and Benoit's scheduled matches for tonight. He instead puts these two in a match against each other in the semi main event spot, and the winner of that match gets a shot at Finley's TV title at Slambury. Steve Austin arrives to Raw next to cut a promo. On Nitro, DDP takes on Lenny Lane. So not only does Austin have the odds stacked against him at Over the Edge, he also doesn't know who he's facing tonight in this tag team match, and he doesn't know who his partner's gonna be. But Austin says he isn't gonna cry and complain about it because he knows Vince hates him, and Austin feels the exact same way about his boss. Austin doesn't care who his partner is tonight and who he's gonna face, but he still wants McMahon to prove he's a man by coming down to the ring and having a discussion about tonight's main event. McMahon appears on the Titantron and he says Austin will be going over the edge thanks to the three musketeers here and what they have planned at the pay per view. In regards to tonight, McMahon asks his stooges who Austin's partner's gonna be and they don't have any idea, apparently. See no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil. Austin says these guys can cover their eyes, their mouths and their ears, they can't cover their asses and that's exactly where Steve Austin's gonna stick his WWF belt when all is said and done. That's the bottom line cause Stone Cold said so. As Austin heads back up the ramp we see Sable on the Titantron, she's getting ready to beat up her man next on Raw's War. Over on Nitro, check out Mark Curtis selling the DDP bang, fantastic. There's a real issue on Nitro tonight with every match so far being extremely predictable and this one is no different. Still though, at least we have Raven vs DDP later in the week. It's probably the match I'm looking forward to the most, it's Lambert. DDP gives Walmart Chris Jericho a break when he lets him perform an arm drag, but Leonard then takes advantage by pulling DDP's hair. So Double L gets the taste slapped out of his mouth before taking a tilt the world sidewalk slam. Lane manages to drop DDP's neck over the top rope. He then kicks him in those forever injured ribs and after choking Paige in the corner, Mr. Lane makes the ultimate mistake. He puts up the diamond cutter symbol. DDP fires up on Lenny as the crowd make a lot of noise. Lenny does try to fight back with a bulldog, but it's no good. DDP gets back up, he floors Lane with a discus clothesline, and DDP ends it with a super diamond cutter. Paige wins as expected. He then grabs a mic and he says, quote, Raven, not only will I bang you at Slambury, come out now and let's see you get banged right now. DDP seems to really want to bang Raven. Raven strolls out with his riot squad, he takes a look at Paige, and then he just walks away. Sable wants to fight Mark Merrow next on Raw, while Hollywood Hogan cuts a promo on Nitro. So, Sable tells Mero to get out and settle this domestic dispute once and for all. Marvelous Mark comes out being as endearing to the fans as humanly possible, and he starts warming up in the ring while his wife looks at him with pure disgust. Sable grabs a mic and she says she can't believe Mark would go through with this. I mean, you challenged them Sable, but alright. 
Mark thinks Sable's trying to weasel her way out of this showdown, so he lifts her up for a TKO before setting her back down again. He says he could have knocked her out for good if he really wanted to, but Mero's a gentleman and he decided to let Sable go. Now, Mero wants Sable to apologize for ruining his career in the World Wrestling Federation. God, if you think you've had a tough mark, just wait for, I don't know, 5 seconds or so because Sable kicks Mero in his marvelous nuts and Sable hits him with a Sable bomb. As the story goes, apparently, Mark taking the Sable bomb led to WWF Champion Steve Austin refusing to wrestle him. The reason being, no one would now believe that Mark would be able to beat a guy like Stone Cold after his wife powerbombed him. Mark Merrow himself said this in an interview. Here comes Hollywood Hogan folks, the man who's likely gonna face Randy Savage again tonight on Nitro. I didn't take such punishment into consideration when beginning this video series. Hogan says his new Three Ninjas movie is in cinemas and we should all rush out to see it right now, forget Nitro. He also says he's currently filming his latest blockbuster, Assault on Devil's Island 2 The Death Merchant, the sequel to Assault on Devil's Island of course. It was also known as Shadow Warriors 2 Assault on Death Mountain which led to the first Assault on Devil's Island getting retroactively named Shadow Warriors 1, Attack on Devil's Island, or just Shadow Warriors 1. Add in the fact there was also an arcade game named Shadow Warriors in Europe, but it was also a name change from Ninja Gaiden in Japan. The home versions of Ninja Gaiden for NES and Game Boy would also get called Shadow Warriors in Europe. There's a Japanese TV show named Shadow Warriors. There's multiple books named Shadow Warriors, including one by Tom Clancy. There's a band named Shadow Warriors, a Warhammer group of Shadow Warriors, and you know what, I blame it all on this guy right here, this soul destroying waste of TV time, the booty man. Hogan says the outsiders were looking for the Hulk Hogan rub when they jumped to WCW. If they were friend or foe, it didn't matter, they didn't have enough to be megastars in world championship wrestling, so that's why they wanted to work with Hulk Hogan. Hogan heard the Macho Man earlier, and yes, he accepts the match. Hulk vs Macho tonight on Nitro one more time. Hulk also heard what Big Sexy said earlier, so Hulk calls Nash out to face the music. Nash comes to the ring and he says this. First off, before you open your mouth, why don't you take your wife's sunglasses off? Hogan says Nash should take off his sister's tea back, but it didn't hit as hard as Nash's little statement. Nash wants to know why Hogan was checking him out in the back, Hogan says it's because Nash is too sweet, and Nash says, yes I am sexy. They should have walked away right there because that was a nice little exchange. Hogan says Nash has to apologize to everyone wearing white and black in the arena tonight because it's not about the red and black. Hogan accuses Nash of poisoning Conan and Kurt Hennig. So Nash needs to say sorry to Mr. Hogan, forget about all this Wolfpack stuff, and Kevin needs to fall in line with the rest of the white and black NWO. Nash approaches Hogan and Hollywood's team of mid-carders stop Big Kev. Nash says he's not apologizing and he'll take out the three stooges here if that means getting the Hulk Hogan. Hogan says he's came to this gunfight with a big gun and the Hulkster has a big surprise. Oh my god. Oh, I don't believe it. Wait, what? The giant is back in the NWO? Who? That's... This is strange, god they've got some explaining to do here right? The black and white attack Nash, he's doing alright until the Jan comes in with a clothesline. The big man sprays NWO on Nash's back while Hogan says we're about to see a chokeslam but then the wolf pack hit the ring, as in Conan, Dusty Rhodes and Savage, the same Savage that Dusty ripped into earlier. NWO Hollywood get out of the ring and the commentators are just as confused as everyone else. Remember, Sting and the Jan face Nash and Hall later this week at Slamboree. Jerry Lawler gets a visitor next on Raw's War. On Nitro, Chris Jericho gets interviewed by Mean Gene Okerlund. So Lawler's just sitting there doing his job and drooling over Sable, and then The Undertaker shows up. Taker wants revenge for Lawler making fun of Mummy Taker last week, so the King gets punched in the jaw before getting sent into the ring. Taker chokeslams the King, not too sure how that steel chair got in there though, and just when Lawler's about to get Tombstone, Kane's music plays in the arena. Taker's brother and Paul Bear walk out and Paul says either the truth's hurting the dead man so bad or the undertaker doesn't want to believe a single word that Paul said. Next week Paul's gonna prove he knocked it into mummy taker and he's gonna prove he's Kane's father. Kane sets his paro off before walking away. Taker looks up the rampway for a moment before going back to Jerry Lawler and the king ends up taking that tombstone pile driver. 
Jim Ross has no idea how Paul Bear can prove he's Kane's father. It's like there's absolutely no test that can be done to prove such things. Al Snow runs out after the break to take over Jerry Lawler's position on commentary. Al's talking to Head, he's acting a little erratic. Security guys come over along with Pat Patterson and Al says over and over again he needs to see Vince. Al runs away from security, he gets in the ring and the crowd cheers as Head gets lifted into the air. The audience loves Head. We cut back to DX and Hunter announces that the CNN mission of Operation DX has come to an end. It's time to fire the final shot at WCW and here it is. Brilliant. On Nitro, Chris welcomes us to Monday Night Jericho and Chris reminds Mean Gene to call him by his real name. Lionheart Chris Jericho, the man of a thousand and four holds, the Ayatollah of rock and roller and true paragon of virtue for the entire free world. Chris says he's the greatest cruiserweight champion ever, he's acquired all these trophies from his fallen enemies, so tonight he's gonna retire the belt after his match because no one can beat him. James J. Bay Bay Dillon shows up, he's been busy tonight hasn't he? And he says the title isn't getting retired just yet. It's Slamboree, there's gonna be a 15 man battle royal, the winner of that battle royal will face Jericho at Slamboree also. Jericho's irate at first but then he thinks about it for a moment. The man who survives the battle royal will never survive a match against Chris Jericho afterwards, so Jericho's all for it. He then reveals his now fragile Dean Malenko portrait. A true man of respect, a man of virtue. Jericho said he left his shrine in the dressing room for 5 minutes and someone must have screwed around with his picture of Dean Dean. Joe Malenko, Dean's brother then appears on the entranceway and he gets in the ring. Jericho says he has no issues with Joe but Joe thinks otherwise. Jericho's disrespected the Malenko family and Jericho tries to backtrack when he says he's got nothing against the Malenkos. Chris wants to let bygones be bygones and Joe actually accepts this. Malenko takes the picture but then Chris attacks when Joe's back's turned. He uses Rey Mysterio's injured knee to strike Dean's brother and Joe also gets the portrait broken over his back. Triple H vs Owen Hart on Raw, Sick Boy vs Glacier on Monday Nitro, we have returned to Casa del Frosty Balls. DX come to the ring and X-Pac says the team are just back from Atlanta, the boys in blue got called to throw DX in jail but you'll never catch us alive lousy copper. In regards to Bischoff's promo earlier tonight, Waltman says he has no idea what Bischoff's smoking because Sean didn't ask for an apology, he only wanted Bischoff to be a man and not when it was only convenient for Eric to do so. X-Pac doesn't kiss up to Vince McMahon, he certainly didn't kiss up to Eric Bischoff and that's why he doesn't work in WCW anymore. This is an overlooked little moment right here, we have guys cutting promos on each other on the same night on two different TV shows. Road Dog then grabs the mic. Degeneration X proudly brings to you. Shut up. We can see Triple H's CNN pass as he goes through his are you ready speech. Hunter says DX loves Baltimore and the Baltimore ladies but he's interrupted by Owen Hart. Owen says he and Hunter have some unfinished business, Triple H invites Owen down to the ring. Owen walks down the ramp but then he stops and he calls down Rock, Dalo, Mark Henry and Kama. We take a commercial break, we come back to another Triple H vs Owen Hart match but this time the dynamic is totally changed. This week, Triple H and DX are positioned as babyfaces and that's how they'll remain for the foreseeable future. Owen Hart is now a heel so naturally the match plays out a little different than previous encounters. When Owen finds himself in trouble he performs a low blow for example and Owen also has no issue throwing Hunter to the wolves and allowing the nation to attack his opponent. With that being said, Triple H is no saint either. D Generation X get involved too when they have the opportunity to do so. We see a pile driver from Triple H and a pile driver from Owen Hart which one do you think looked better? The match comes to an end when Owen bites Triple H's ear and Hunter falls to the mat. Owen wants to go airborne but China pushes him and he smashes his little sharpshooter on the top rope. This leads to the nation and DX squaring up to each other on the outside, so we have no winner in this one folks. Hunter clotheslines Owen over the top rope, the two factions argue for a bit and we go to commercial break. On Nitro, Glacier says backstage that there was a lot of fanfare and a lot of hype before his debut. <laughs> yeah, Glacier flat out lies when he says he lived up to the hype and what he brought to the table was the most devastating move in pro wrestling ever, the cryonic kick. That's a really funny way to say chin lock. Glacier says everyone's copying his kick but he does it best, all these imitators are gonna get taken out. 
right? Yeah, right, Chilly Chode. It's not like your whole existence isn't based off imitation, right? After such a heel promo, Glacier comes to the ring to face Sick Boy, another WCW heel. So the crowd are gonna naturally stay silent because no one wants to cheer for either of these guys. Sick Boy lands a springboard back elbow, but the silly sausage gets caught up on the top rope when trying a running corner attack. Glacier, uh, <laughs> Glacier, you know what? Just watch. It's very well documented. Let's look at that again. Glacier, master of the cryonic kick, misses a kick completely. Sick Boy bumps into Nick Patrick anyway, and Patrick has a real delayed reaction. Because the reaction is so delayed, Glacier tries to kick Sick Boy again. He does eventually connect, but the spot has been totally blown. After saying no one can perform the cryonic kick like Glacier, he sure did make a dog's dinner out of this one. One more kick from Glacier, Sick Boy goes down, the referee's out, so here comes Saturn, and I'm not even joking. Saturn Saturn showed Glacier how it's done with a sweet super kick right to the jaw. The botching continues when Sick Boy covers Glacier. Glacier kicks out a two, but the bell rings. And immediately afterwards, Glacier hits another cryonic kick to win the match. All the Glacier jokes aside, this was a total mess and it's made even funnier thanks to Glacier's promo beforehand. Saturn hates to see such bad wrestling, so he hits Glacier with a gargoyle suplex and a death volley driver after the bell. Glacier absolutely 100% deserved it. We've got some promos next, Goldust on Raw, Lex Luger on Nitro. This dude's so hyped to see the total package that he put his friend in a torture rack. Rumor has it that this boy is still in hospital. Mean Gene wants to know how Lex feels about the Rick and Scott Steiner rivalry and Lex says he's gonna keep it short and sweet, thank god. He says he's tired of all this NW Wolfpack versus NW black and white nonsense. He's tired of the popularity contests and he's tired of the power struggles. He then confirms what Buff Bagwell told us when he joined Reliving the War. Rick Steiner had a shoulder injury and WCW used the beatdown last week as a way to ride Steiner out of TV for a while. So Lex wants to face either Scott Steiner, Bran Adams or both guys at Slambury. He tells James J. Bebe Dylan to get the contract sorted first thing in the morning. On Raw, Dustin Runnels brings a barrel out of the stage. He puts his gold dust ring attire into the barrel along with his wig. He pours gasoline all over his gear and he sets it on fire. He says he's worked too hard for Vince McMahon over these past three years. The Rhodes name has a lot of honor, pride and dignity, but Dustin has no dignity left thanks to Vince McMahon's sick imagination. Dustin blames Vince for his relationships breaking up with Dusty, Terry and his daughter Dakota and it's all because he became a freak for WWF. McMahon punished him with a match against Kane after Dustin couldn't beat Stone Cold and Dustin has had enough. Goldust dies tonight and Vince McMahon will never forget the name of Dustin. Good promo here and when you first see this you think WWF are onto something. Let's see how it all plays out. Too Cold and Terry Funk vs Kai and Tai on Raw, Chris Benoit vs Booker T on Nitro. So the winner of this Booker vs Benoit match faces Finley at Slambury. Either man's a good choice really. We'll do this one quickly seeing as we have a lot more Benoit vs Booker matches to get through in the future. This one was very back and forth with the advantage switching around 5 or 6 times. Booker delivered a hard press slam that looked great before the match went to the outside but back in the ring Benoit answered with a German suplex. Benoit was unable to stay in the driver's seat after a power slam followed by a Booker T back elbow, but things turned around for Chris when Booker missed a Harlem sidekick. Chris was able to hit his diving headbutt, but still Booker T kicked out. The former TV champ lands his axe kick and a sidewalk slam! Booker then lands a flapjack, but Chris decided to pull in Mark Curtis when Booker went for another Hardham sidekick. This caused Booker to take his eyes off his opponent for just a moment, and it gave Chris enough time to trap the arm and apply the crossface. Chris Benoit wins on Nitro, and Chris Benoit faces Fit Finley at Slambury. On Raw, we learned that Kai and Tai's manager is named Yamaguchi. He calls the fans scumbags before introducing the new generation with a new Japanese attitude. 
This is Kai and Tai. The group then attack Funk and Scorpio from behind and what we learn very early on is that this group work extremely well as a team. They've got moves that involve all three guys so it's a very unique faction here in terms of in ring work. The match is quite chaotic with Togo, Teo and Funaki all pretty much staying in the ring from bell to bell. Scorpio power bombs all three guys before missing a moonsault, a triple dropkick sends Scorpio back to his corner and Terry Funk then gets in to teach these young boys a lesson. He applies the spinning toe hold on Teo and Funaki but the numbers are too much. Takamichi Noku and Bradshaw run down to lend a hand and that's gonna be a DQ finish. Kai and Tai escape through the audience before we cut over to Vince McMahon. Vince is talking to someone but we don't know who. He says Austin has never had a physical specimen like you for a tag team partner. Al Snow is then seen outside the arena and he's trying to get back inside. He doesn't have a ticket anymore so he ends up getting escorted away. Jim Cornette says this isn't WCW there are no free tickets here. Raw ends this week with Steve Austin and a mystery partner taking on Dido and The Rock. On Nitro we've got Hollywood Hogan vs Randy Savage. The world title's on the line once again and the booty man's here with Hollywood. What isn't here with Hollywood though is his wife's sunglasses. <laughs> he got you Hogan, he got you good. Savage attacks right at the opening bell, he chokes Hogan with his own shirt and Hogan begs for mercy when Savage won't let up. It's the same old stuff, Hogan sticks a thumb in Savage's eye, he scratches his back, he hits a corner clothesline and he chokes Macho with his boot. On the outside Randy gets thrown into the ring post, there's some slow action at the guardrails and back in the ring we go back to the chokeholds, it's absolutely brutal. A low blow brings Randy back into it for a moment but Hollywood lands a big boot, he then delivers a body slam but he misses his signature leg drop. Randy then goes for the elbow drop but Brutus Beefcake pushes him off the top rope and this is where the match ends ladies and gents. Macho still gets to his feet and it's still looking bleak for Hollywood so here comes Bret Hart holding the world title. Bret smacks Randy, the macho man crumbles to the mat while booty man distracts Charlie Robinson and check out this instant karma. Bret spits on Randy and someone instantly throws a drink over the hitman. Bret has some choice words for the fan on the outside as Hogan pins Macho so Hollywood is still your world champion. Big Sexy comes down to the ring and so does Roddy Piper. Roddy says Hogan's been disqualified and Randy Savage is the winner. Piper also announces that he's gonna referee the Slamboree Savage vs Hart match and he makes it clear that he wants the two competitors to rip each other apart. He tells Macho if Bret bites him in the throat then Savage should bite him right back. If there's any low blows then there should be no complaints. The recipient of said low blow should go ahead and return the favour by kicking his opponent in the nads. The giant then comes down to the ring, Hogan has to calm him down and Nitro ends with Sting watching everything from the rafters. On Raw, The Rock says the fire between he and Austin reignites tonight before Stone Cold makes his way to the ring. Vince McMahon's voice can then be heard in the arena and McMahon announces Stone Cold's partner. No, it's not the giant robot monster, it's Vince McMahon himself, of course it is. Austin has no choice, McMahon stands in his corner as the match gets underway. Jim Ross makes fun of the Nitro main event by saying Austin and Rock are not senior citizens as Rocky dodges a Stone Cold stunner. And after taking care of Dilo, Austin turns his attention to Briscoe and Patterson. The Stooges get wiped out and Austin then goes back after Rocky. It stays on the outside for a while where Stone Cold continues to destroy the IC champion and when it gets back inside the ropes, Dato gets tagged in and he almost immediately gets taken down with a Luthez press. The WWF are giving fans a Stone Cold showcase tonight and the audience loves it. Dato does manage to throw Austin out of the ring and Pat Patterson gets in the cheap shot. This allows Rocky to take over and drop Austin on the guardrail. Dato tags out and Rocky gets his head taken off with a hard clothesline but when it goes back to the outside it's Stone Cold who takes a bump on the ring steps. Vince McMahon watches on with delight as his tag team partner's now in a bad spot. Rocky delivers the people's elbow and even worse he applies a chin lock afterwards. Stone Cold replies with a sleeper hold but Vince distracts the referee and Dilo comes back in illegally. We see a sweet elbow drop from Dilo before Rock comes in with chin lock number two. Dilo misses the lowdown. Stone Cold crawls to Vince McMahon but Austin's going solo tonight. No way he's gonna tag in his partner. Dilo takes a stone cold stunner, Rock drops an elbow on his own partner and then Vince McMahon gets in to clothesline the WWF champion. 
The Stooges start beating up Austin and they hold him up to give McMahon a free shot. Stone Cold kicks McMahon away and the Stooges find themselves in a bit of trouble, but Do Love then appears and this is just too much for Stone Cold at this point. Raw fades out as Dustin Runnels hits the ring along with D-Generation X and we're left with a cliffhanger that even Eric Bischoff would have been proud of. So this one ends in a no contest, I think. Hard choice this week. Both shows had weak points and they had strong points too, but I really can't decide which one I liked more, so I'm calling it a draw. Eric challenging Vince McMahon on Nitro is a real moment of the Monday Night War, and I like the stuff with Raven this week along with Jericho's work, but Nitro completely ruined things with another Macho vs Hogan main event that just wasn't good. You also had other bad matches on Nitro such as Sick Boy vs Glacier. Raw had an entertaining main event, but every other match was either very average or something we had seen before, such as Triple H vs Owen Hart. So in my opinion, we don't have a clear winner this week. We now have 15 ties on the board. In the TV ratings, things were also tied neck and neck. Both shows got a 4.3. This is the first time since 1995 that both shows drew the same rating. Slamboree's later in the week, so I hope you come over and watch the show. I also hope YouTube doesn't restrict the video or remove it, but we'll cross that bridge when we get there. As always, you can see Slamboree reliving the war 134 and other videos early by supporting me on Patreon. On Raw next week, McMahon replies to Dustin's comments, we see the in-ring debut of Val Venus, and we'll also find out if Paul Bear really is Kane's daddy. Thanks for tuning in guys, I really appreciate it, and I'll see you all next time.